Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. If you've been a long-time listener to this show, Brittany, you recognize her. I mean, the video is a little bit fuzzy right now, everyone. If we're gonna, if we're not, you know, gonna be making stuff up now, but she'll be getting a little bit better now on. But yeah, she's on here to give us an update on what she's been up to. She hasn't been competing for about three years now, so we're gonna talk about that and just yeah, all things health and fitness. And most importantly, she's currently our guest. Brittany, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Absolutely. Well, before we even get into like why you stopped competing and what the, what's happened, like what has it been like three years, almost three years removed from competing and how have you adjusted to all that? Um, well, uh, I've figured out that there is a lot more competing or a lot more to life than just standing on stage and competing. Um, I'm not going to say that it's been uh, all gravy and rainbows or anything, but uh, it's been really kind of a breath of fresh air to not live my life solely in the gym for three hours a day and uh, have to constantly worry about what I'm eating or not eating or anything like that. Wait, uh, you're telling me you didn't so, get absolute joy from spending three hours a day in the gym? I mean, back then I didn't think it was so bad, but now now that I've branched off and uh, experienced other things, I kind of realized just how much uh, how much of myself I did, I not, well, lose, I guess, while de dedicating so much time into it. I mean, like I said, there's so much more uh, to life than just competing. And I think a lot of competitors get, get so tangled up in the web of competing that they forget that the world is really big out there and that there are so many other things, even life past competing. I mean, there's, there's very few people who compete till they're a hundred, you know? So what are you going to do when that time is over? Where, where are you going to go from that? And if you are not preparing for life after stage, life after competing, you might, you might watch life just completely pass you by and you've missed it. I'm going to correct you. I don't think there's ever been anyone that's competed up to a hundred. So I'm just, I'm just going to fact check there. I, I honestly, now I think about it. No, there, ha there hasn't been. So, just a little fact check there, just because I was like, wait, if there if there has been someone that's competed over a hundred, yeah. I definitely need to talk to that person if they're still alive because yeah, that is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's nobody really that uh, there's not many people who even compete over sixty. You know, I mean, I think there might be a couple of like of the women bodybuilders, like, but I don't think they compete. They might still be in the circuit. They might still be in the in the industry, but as far as standing on stage competing. I mean, they hand out how many Masters Pro cards a year and how many actually compete at, you know, at 60. Yeah, exactly. And I was going to say, I probably talked to like three or four of them that actually like still compete past their 60s. And that's one of the most impressive. Those are the guests that really just inspire me more than anything else, because good God, if you're still able to do it at that age, you know, more power right. to you. But that's one thing that I struggle with too. When I, when I leveled back on my training a little bit and I haven't really, you know, been working out as much as that you do realize like, wow, it's not that you wasted all that time, but it's like that you spent that much time working out where you're like, I can't believe right. I was able to do that. So how do you, when you go back and look at your time competing, how do you not necessarily cope with that, but how do you deal with the fact that like, wow, I spent that much time doing this. I mean, I would, I would not trade the years that I spent competing, which was, I mean, almost 10, you know, almost. Oh, I just got to correct myself. I'm, I'm not saying like competing part, but how do you cope yourself being like, how did I spend this much time in the gym? First of all, like how, how did I uh, physically do it? <laughs> again, again, it's at the time I really enjoyed it. Um, and I do still enjoy training, but I'm ready to get in the gym 45 minutes, possibly an hour if I'm doing cardio and then get out, ride my horses, spend time with my family, uh, you know, we built, we just built a, a brand new house out on family land. Uh, we live in the country. So there's plenty to do out here um, that can replace being in the gym for three hours. I hope there would be because dear God, if that's the only thing that you have is the gym for three hours and it's like, okay, then you might, as, you might as well. And again, I'm not knocking anyone that spends three hours in the gym. It's just one of those things where if you do anything for a, a long period of time too, where like, there will come a day when I stop doing this podcast and I will look back at it and say, I can't believe I spent this many hours talking to people and doing all this stuff. So it's not me right. knocking people that go to the gym a lot. Cause trust me, I was at that point in my life in college where it would be like two to three hours a day in the gym. And then you look back at it and you're like, how, how was I able to spend that much time, you know, in the gym? But what was the cataclyst for you for deciding to 
take a step away from competing? Uh, well, so the last time I stepped on stage was in 2021. I did two shows. I did the Texas Pro, and then I went and did the the Phoenix Pro, or the what was the Rising Phoenix um, show. And at that time, right right before then, or right after that, my husband and I got married. Uh, so I prepped for those shows while also planning a wedding. And uh, once I got married, I kind of thought, you know what, I'll I'll take a little bit of time off. Um, my husband and I were going to focus more on building a family. Uh, so it's, uh, I'd say, decently hard to get pregnant while also prepping for a bodybuilding show. Um, I've so, seen one person so, do it. And so that's, that just goes to show how rare it is, where they were prepping for a show and they're like, oh, crap, I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah, oh, man, I'm pregnant. So um, that was really the first thing we were going to try and start a family um, that did not really pan out the way we had, we, that we had kind of planned on it. And when I say we were trying, we weren't like going to be doing in vitro or anything like that. Like I always was just like, if it's not going to naturally happen, like I'm, we're not going to do it. Um, so, but then in that, during that time, I continued to watch and, uh, study and research what was going on in the industry. I tried to stay active in it. Um, and I just kind of started seeing this trend and this pattern of people being rewarded that, and I would say, I don't really want to look like that. Like, I don't, I don't want to look like that. Like, I mean, I was a women's physique competitor and I even thought, well, maybe I need, need to drop back down to figure, but I don't have the actual shape and my muscle bellies do not get huge and full and, and voluptuous enough to be in figure. So I kind of was like, well, maybe I'll just, I'll take a little bit longer of a break and I'll see if it starts to backtrack a little bit. Um, then in that time we ended up, uh, going into fostering to adopt, uh, our niece. So then that took precedence. Um, that takes a whole lot of time and energy and focus to make those things happen between getting licensed, being there for her things. I mean, she's four years old and she was two almost three at the time when everything started to kind of go down. Um, so then that became my number one priority. Um, and now we're kind of coming towards the end, we hope, of that whole ordeal. Um, but even now, now that I see a light at the end of the tunnel for all of those things, I just don't have the same passion or the same respect for the, the division in the industry anymore. And so it just kind of I just, I, I'm just not very interested in doing it right now. Um, when I started doing women's physique, it was the Dana Lynn Bailey era, the Danny Reardon era. Um, and those were two competitors that I really looked up to and aspired to be like. And even now, I'm pretty sure even those be Olympians if they start competing right now. Yeah. So just just based on their size alone what do you think was the reasoning behind why the judges keep rewarding these extremes and keep pushing the sport further and further do you think it's money or do you think it's just because they prefer the look because i've i've fallen into like it's got to be like half or half and then there's got to be other reasons too because when you look at how safety is kind of thrown to the wind when it comes to some of these looks they're rewarding it, there has to be some kind of motive in my opinion I don't know this. I I don't really think it's money because I mean, it's out there. It's I mean, every especially with the the Arnold this past weekend. There's been a lot of talk about why Arnold doesn't have these women's divisions. Um, and a lot of the the talk has been well because these women's divisions aren't bringing in money. They're not bringing in the sponsorships. They're not filling the seats in the auditoriums, and that's true. I mean, being at you know having competed even in 2021 women's physique was not like something that just brought in a ton of seats and filled, filled auditoriums. Um, so money, nah, I don't think it's necessarily that. Um, I don't, I think everything has evolution and the evolution of it is it's easier for the judges to pick the biggest and the, the shreddiest period. It's easy to stand up there and say, well, she's the most conditioned. She's the biggest. That's it. Like there, there's our winner. Um, I think also there's kind of a, a shock and awe factor when somebody that is 
larger and has, you know, striations in their eyeballs that it's just a, oh my gosh, look at that. Like, obviously it takes work to do that. I'm not knocking the work that these, these competitors put in. Yes, they are working hard. There just needs to be a set standard to what that is for each division. And right now the lines to me are so blurred that you, you can't actually say this is women's physique because it's, it used to be, well, women's physique or figure is supposed to be 30% more muscular than bikini. And they're supposed to have this four to one shoulder to waist ratio. And, um, you know, even, I mean, you look at Shanique Grant, like she doesn't compete anymore, but she was by all, you know, sense and purposes, she was an incredible women's physique competitor. And then you had Villegas come in and in the beginning, Sarah Villegas was the same too. But even now for me, she is on a far side of, of what women's physique was supposed to be. So if you could put in like a lightweight women's bodybuilding, there would be a, a big group of women's physique and even some of the figure girls that could shift over into a lightweight bodybuilding because maybe they're not Maybe they're a little too much for women's physique, but they're not really going to be very competitive in women's open bodybuilding. So if they had a place to go, maybe it would help a little bit. Um, but I don't foresee them really doing that. Yeah, because so. the moment that I've heard some some people talk about how there's some shows where the person wins the uh, figure pro card and then they win their physique pro card, like the same show, it's like that should never be a possibility ever. No, and you hear them say, well, we're judging what's on stage. It's all about what shows up that day. There was somebody that was more figure than that girl who just won women's physique. Or there was somebody, if you, if that girl won figure, then you are st- setting the standard that women's physique is going to have to be a little bit bigger. I do understand some of these national shows. I mean, I've seen some of the classes that only have four women's physique girls in them. You know, like the A and the B class three or four, maybe five girls, and half of them show up without the conditioning or without symmetry. I understand that, okay, now we have to give it to this person because we can't reward this. We can't reward somebody who shows up with, you know, a little bit of extra fluff on their back or somebody who does not have a lat spread that, you know, is symmetrical to their bottom, you know, to their bottom half. But I and I'm sure it did happen back when I first started competing. I don't remember it like where somebody would win a pro card in one division and turn around and win it in the next division up. Um, that's just that's crazy to me as well. Yeah, I just the moment that I've heard that I'm I know I started to lose a little bit of faith myself, honestly. And what was the first reaction like? from people around you when you announced it, like, Hey, I'm going to stop competing now. What was their overall reaction? Like I had a lot of people ask me, well, why? Um, I mean, it's not like I was ever an Olympian. Uh, I never placed in, you know, the top three of my division or anything. So, I mean, I hate to say that I'm like a nobody in the industry, but I mean, I wasn't somebody who people were, you know, like, Oh my God. She used to win all the time, and now she's not competing anymore. Hey, you were a two-time um, featured guest on this people, podcast. You were well... I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Thanks. Um, but essentially, people wanted to know why. Is there a reason? And in the beginning, to avoid throwing any shade on the IFBB, I would tell them, yeah, me and my husband are just trying to have you know a family. Can't do that and compete at the same time. You can. I can't. I can't. Um, so, but now when people ask me, Hey, are you ever going to step on stage again? My first answer is not until something changes, not until they start scaling it back. And it's almost like the genie is out of the bottle. Now. I don't know if they'll ever be able to put the genie back inside the bottle. Um, I think once you go to a certain level, it would take a massive overhaul, uh, to do that or, put in and propagate like a natural, a natural division or do natural shows. I mean, they have the Ben Weeder natural. Um, if maybe they did a couple more like that, maybe it would give people who are not looking to do hard steroids or go that, that route 
a place to compete. So I don't know if that's something that the IFBB is looking to be interested in or if even a lot of promoters are interested in because then you have to worry about how are you going to test these competitors? I mean, some of these, some of the anabolics will leave your system in a matter of weeks. So what, you're going to steroid up until three weeks before the show and then cut everything out. And so the heart, the hardest part is already done. And now we're just going to like coast in and be off of our drugs, you know? So that's why I've always laughed every single time when people were like, Oh, that person's never filled a drug test. And it's like, you do realize how easy it is to cheat a drug test that like most people just, if anyone, the Joe yeah. public knew how easy it was, then the fact that someone would say they've never filled a drug test would never be an excuse for why someone who isn't blatantly abusing right. something hasn't, hasn't ever done that. So right. I always, I always just sort of, you know, laugh at that myself, but yeah, I mean, and yeah, I don't even know what they can do to change. Cause honestly, this is my personal opinion. I'd say five years, this sport's gone. By 2030, the way things are going right now, it's going to be, I mean, I mean there's, there's good, definitely. Oh, I was just going to say, there's going to be so many people dropping no, dead ahead, probably in the next I, couple of years that it's not going to be, people are just going to stop competing. Well, and you know, some people I've heard, I've heard a couple of people say, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people in the, in the IFBB for, or NPC and IFBB and only a handful of them die a year. It shouldn't be any of them dying from steroid use in a year. Like it's like, but no, I was just, okay, I just, so just got to say this. Like, could you imagine what the NFL would be like if like three or four football players died every single year in a season? Yeah. And it's, and then when, you know, it's, it's even, it's a little bit weird because then immediately it's, it should, it's sad that the fact that when someone, one of us does pass the first reaction, the first uh, go to is well they were taking hard steroids like well look at them they were steroided up or look at everything that they took in the past it can it's not ever just you know what she was sick she had you know maybe they did have cancer maybe they did have an underlying heart problem but the fact that everybody's first initial out of the box reason is steroid use that says something if that is the first um the first thing that people think there's a reason that's the first people think, because if you're in the IFBB, people know what you had to either be there or what you're doing to still be a contender in some of these top shows. Um, so that's to me, that is very sad that it's not like, oh, maybe she was sick or man, maybe he was, you know, maybe he was really sick and we just don't know. And then rarely does a reason ever surface as to what happened. Um, whether that be because the family doesn't really want to release that information or people just don't want to talk about it because they don't want to admit what the truth was and that, that that could actually be a high volume of steroid usage. Which I never, I mean, obviously, like if you're in a profession that like you can't be using drugs or anything like that, I never got why people are just so not uh, like not willing to just say like, hey, yeah, I, t I take that because it's like it's. It's not that big of a deal, honestly, in like my opinion. Obviously, like like I said before, like if you're a doctor or you're a dentist or something like that, and like you can't admit that, like yeah, I'm on drugs because then you'll you'll get fired or like you'll lose your job. But like other than that, I really and I get for women why it might be a little you know out there just because it, some of it is like male hormones and that's kind of like a stigma to it. Like if you're <laughs> if you want to maintain to be a woman and you're taking a lot of that stuff, but yeah, for me it's just like just if you're more upfront and honest about it, more less than less people are gonna probably abuse it and die from it honestly right well and it's nowadays this is the we are in an era of wellness and life preserving and longevity um there are so many people out there now who go to the doctor and they're like you know what i don't want to feel 40 i don't want to feel 50 i don't want to feel 60 i want to i want my hormone panel to say that i'm 30 that i'm 25 and that is providing a longevity of life, you know, biological age versus chronological age. I mean, there are people out there who, you know, when your testosterone levels, and I'm one of them, when your testosterone levels, I naturally run very low. Like my body does not produce at, like testosterone, even at a normal level for a female. So do I feel better when I am responsibly and minimally taking a hormone replacement therapy? Absolutely. Do is hormone replacement therapy shoving me up in the 500s for testosterone? No. Okay. No. 
We would be able to tell if you were in the 500. If you were in the 500 for testosterone, Brittany, we would be able to tell. <laughs> yeah, so I she mean, would be. She would be. Hi, Ryan. How's it going? Hi, uh, Ryan. Yeah, you know. So it's. I understand that people don't want to feel their age, and they want longevity of life, and I respect that, and I support that. But longevity of life, it's no, it's no better to run asinine amounts of it than it is to be in the dirt with it. So in today's, in today's age, like it's something that is common, just steroids. People talk about it in the gym now. I mean, Hey, like what test are you running or whatever? When I first started competing, it was super hush hush. It was like, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about steroids. Like you don't, you don't talk about that because that shit's illegal. You know, now like, it's just like, Hey, what test are you taking? What doctor you go to? You know, where can I get some of that? And even now here in Texas, uh, in Dallas, there was a doctor and I'll say his name because I mean, it doesn't really matter, but there was a doctor's name was Dr. Shelton and he was the bodybuilding doctor for many competitors. And now they came in and I guess they caught him like wandering money and there's an article about it and everything and, um, prescribing things that should not have been prescribed as much as they were being prescribed. And so now like he's out, like, so there are plenty of people in the Dallas area scrambling to figure out like, Oh crap, where am I going to get my Alexander loan? Where am I going to get my test? Man, where am I going to get? I mean, he even had things like, uh, I mean, he had Winstrol on there for a little while. Like, what doctor needs to so you're Winstrol? telling me that there's an opportunity for anyone out there to take his place and become the new drug kingpin. <laughs> That's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. There's an opening. <laughs> Yeah, how does a doctor have so, Winstrol, but, first of all? Because that's like that's like one that like has little to no medical benefits at all. Yeah, I don't I your guess is as good as mine. I mean, he would prescribe like he would have things like <clears throat> excuse me, he would have things like, you know, growth hormone, which I have no issues with growth hormone. I mean, it's very you, there are some side effects to taking too much of growth hormone that I wouldn't want, but essentially like growth hormone is like a beneficial it's something that's beneficial for longevity. Um, you know, but when doctors are so willing to just like pass it out, like tic tacs, um, you know, that's, I think that also has something to do because it's so easy. It's so much easier to get now than having to find somebody on the lowdown on the black market off the street to like, maybe, maybe give you good stuff. Um, You know, so I think that might have some attribution to it. And, you know, coaches nowadays, I have so many competitors and a lot of my clients now are natural. I tell them, if you're going to take something, I'm not telling you what to take. I'm not telling you how much to take. If you want to let me know that this is what you're doing so I can formulate your nutrition and your workouts to like be more beneficial for that, like I'll do that, but I don't even mess with anything that of telling somebody what they need to take. Oh, if you want to win, then you're going to, you're going to have to take some Anivar, you know, oh, if you're going to win, like we don't, you're going to need to really need to jack that testosterone way on up there, you know? Um, and a lot of my clients don't want to do that. I've, I've actually shifted to training more clients for natural federations than I do for the NPC and IFBB because I'm unwilling to put one of my athletes who then most of my competitors also become my friends and I'm not going to put them in a position that could drastically harm them. If not now in the present, in the future. Well, and this is the part where we get to see a reaction to this because when I made that, those rants that I made, I got some reactions from some people and I had two people, I I'm never naming their name just for anom- anonymity. And um, one of them was a, a bikini competitor who is I believe now in their early twenties is taking trend for bikini. And then, um, there is a figure competitor taking D ball <laughs> that, Ooh. um, so yeah, the moment that I realized that it's like at that point, you just got to, what the hell are the coaches thinking is honestly what you're really thinking. And I know sometimes the coaches are the dealers as well, which really, they, one of the reasons why they want to prescribe you is because then they make the money from selling them to you. But it's just like, Again, if we're talking coaches, everyone, at a point where you're that level in competition and your coach is telling you to take that, 
no, just don't, just don't ever do it because, and do your research too. I mean, that's something that I'll say during every podcast, no matter how, you know, how many times people say, oh, you say it all the time. I'm going to keep repeating it till the end of time. Do your own damn research and don't just blindly follow someone else. Right. There's, um, you know, I do, I know plenty of coaches out there who deal what they're telling their competitors to be on. And they do make a little bit of extra cheddar on the side for doing that. Um, the problem with that is, you know, this bikini competitor, this figure competitor. I wonder, and I would question, did they ask their coach about that? Or did their coach come at them and say, hey, well, you know, it could really help. Bo- set both you both was the coach. Both was the coaches. Okay. I feel like in my own, in my own coaching, you know, morals. It's almost like a doctor. They take an oath that says do no harm. Your first obligation to your client is their health and safety. It's not winning because you cannot guarantee that they're going to win just because they take trend, just because they take D ball. That's not going to guarantee them a trophy. Um, But you can help to guarantee that they will continue to live a long, healthy life after they, after you get done with them, because that's why a lot of my clients and or my competitors, my clients that don't compete, come to me. They want to feel better. They want to prolong their life. They want to be able to be healthy and lead a healthier lifestyle. If I am doing something that goes against that, that is actually like completely stepping them back from that, then what am I coaching for? Why am I even a coach? I don't coach people to win on stage. I coach them to win at life. They can't win at life if they're dead. One of the more shocking responses I ever sent when I sent to someone, it's like when they revealed to me what they were taking, I was like, again, I have nothing against that. But like, what, how do you feel about the fact that like your lifespan is going to be com- shortened pretty much by a, by a decent chunk just from what you're taking? Then, and then the response that I got back to for me was who wants to live forever? And then I was just like, I mean, I, I mean, I, if you if you have that mindset, then, yeah, go go for it then. You know, I don't want to live forever. Like I, I joke all the time, man. I don't want to live to be eighty, especially if I, if I feel the way I do right now. Okay, can I just go, on, Brittany? I just got to interrupt you right here. Can yeah. I go on a quick tangent? How I have said that same exact thing for my, for my entire life. Being eighty would fucking suck if we really think about it, where you have to like have people clean you and you have to like do all this. Who the hell would want to live for? And I've made that joke to my because my parents are in their sixties. Where I was like, God, you guys only got probably like five or ten good years left before it just really just all goes completely downhill. But no, like yeah. I have I have said that from the day I was born. It's like because I have a grandpa who's in his mid nineties now and just like he's going blind and stuff. Like, and I see that and I was like, Who the hell wants to live? Like, and grandpa, if you're watching this, I love you. But come on, we we've had the talk. So it's like, but it's like, but it's like yeah. no, because I even told him I I make the joke with him. I was like, Oh, you only got like five years left to a hundred, and he goes, I hope not. He'll <laughs> just say like, yeah, yeah. Like, so. and my mom's like, Oh, I want to live to be a hundred. I want to see everything. Well. Okay, number one, the world today is falling apart to begin with. Like, I don't, I don't even want to know if I want to see what happens by the time I hit a hundred. And, and you want to bring a kid into this world too? Come on, Brittany. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Make and that poor little bastard think, suffer. <laughs> no kidding, you know. I know, I know, I know. Um, and there are there are young people, young competitors who they're not even thinking about that. They are thinking about the here and now. And I did too when I was young. When I was young, I didn't see past next weekend and what party I was going to be at and what dance club we were going to. I mean, I didn't see any of that. Now that I'm 40, I truly have, I've got to think about, um, I have to think about what it is that I'm going to be doing with the next 10 years of my life what how is the next 20 years of my life going to play out am I going to be crippled up and stowed up and unable to like walk because I decided that leg pressing 600 pounds at one time was a cool thing to do um or you know I've got a shoulder injury that um I refuse to go get taken care of because I'm scared of what the doctor's gonna tell me and I'm afraid that I'm gonna be out for six to eight to 12 weeks with repair. Um, my hips don't sit right. My lower back sciatica is like all the time. Um, and all of those things are from the time I spent competing and thinking that I needed to be trying to lift like Ronnie Coleman. You know, it's, um, they don't see that far in the future. And 
props to them for being able to live in the here and now, but there will come a day when you're like, I can't do this anymore and actually live a quality life. However long that is. We got to put a picture of you in your prime physique next to Ronnie Coleman as prime physique and be like, she tried to lift just like Ronnie Coleman. And obviously she's no, but that's like, no, I, and believe me, I, I worship those Ronnie Coleman videos. They're, they're some of the most hilarious things ever. And they're some of the most inspiring where you're like, but then again, then you see how he paid the price on that later on. But like, Hey, to be able to live like that for immortality wise, I mean, Hey, it's, it's worth it in some cases like that. But yeah, I remember, I am so glad that I was a little bit older than then like when COVID first came out and there were those kids at that Florida beach that were like, if I get COVID, I get COVID. Cause that would totally have been me if it was like five years, five years earlier, because yeah, people don't realize when you're that young and a lot of people, if you're, if you haven't been young for quite a while, like if I'm talking to my guests that are in like their sixties, there was a time in your teens and your early twenties when like you literally thought you were immortal. Not, you didn't think you were immortal, but like, you know what I mean? Where like you thought that you were invincible and that nothing bad was ever going right. to happen to you. So I can understand that. But again, that's when I think it's the worst time for someone to really get into that, in, to get into competing and talk to that coach because that coach knows at that age you're the most gullible because you do think mm-hmm. that like you're invincible and you do think that nothing bad can happen to you so then that in the coach's mind they're like hey that's the time of maybe i can start to get them on some of the heavier compounds because obviously the side effects won't happen for maybe like a decade or so later on in life so right. that's just that's the tragedy there too where it's like you're not going to see now obviously some of the dosages that you take you'll see the side effects the very next day but like uh, all most of the other ones like you won't yeah it's like when you're in your 30s 40s or 50s if you've been like abusing them since your early 20s so but yeah it's just it's just unfortunate that it's you know and and some and some people who they make that discovery it's it's too late it and that what you just said by the time you make by the time you make the discovery it can be too late i mean when I first started competing, I was 30. I was like, Shh, kids, nah, I'm good. Like, I don't need any of that. When my husband and I started trying to have kids and my doctors were telling me, like, maybe some of the decisions that you made while you were competing, like, I know you're not doing it now, but maybe some of the decisions that you and your husband made while competing that could have affected your ability. And that's why you're going through what you're going through right now. Um, I know there's plenty of young athletes out there who are like, Shh, I'm not interested in kids. I never want kids. And you might they might say that now, but the older you get, the more your brain kind of like clicks on different parts and rewards itself to think, okay, like I'm getting older and maybe I do want my bloodline to go on a little bit past me. Maybe I do want to leave something else on this earth other than a $10 trophy, you know, and you find they might find somebody that they truly fall in love with. And that person is like, Hey, I really want to have kids with you. I want to start a family with you. And then the decisions that they've made are going to, might affect that their ability to do that. Um, and you know, some people go through life and they're like, I don't need kids ever. And that is what they feel the entire, their entire existence. And that's great for them. If that's their choice, then that's their choice. But when you are, when coaches are putting 20 year olds and 22, 25 year olds on trend, D ball, uh, you know, Winstrol and all of these other, all of these other drugs just to get them a $10 medal or a $10 trophy or 15 minutes worth of Olympia fame, to me, that, that's not worth 30 years of the rest of your life being affected by that two or three years worth of decisions well and we're just talking about the women the men it's not even anywhere oh, yeah. i mean the men i'm talking I've, I've seen like 14 and 15 year olds that are taking that kind of stuff where you're just like yeah. i mean i remember there's even guys in my high school that were abusing that stuff and you're like dude you're like 16 years old what are you doing that for well and their hormones haven't even fully yeah. kicked in yet like male hormones like those hormones don't even start i mean yeah you might be going through puberty but you're not even at an s like at your max peak performance level for your hormones and you never will be naturally now because they have done nothing but supplement 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 and so their body is like shit i ain't gotta make this I, well no i know me. guys from my high school now that and they're it, in their late 20s and they have to take testosterone now in order to keep keep their levels up because their body just naturally doesn't produce yeah. it and it's like you're 28 years old and your body does not produce enough testosterone <laughs> yeah yeah like that's that is insane yeah. um and plus it's you know, and I have, I have a, an athlete, she is a 50, you know, plus year old bikini competitor. She's a pro now. 
she lives her life in her, her lifestyle is the competing. Like I have to like bargain with her just to make her eat a hamburger. Um, but she doesn't do anything crazy. Uh, she doesn't actually, she doesn't really do anything except a very minor hormone replacement pellet, you know, and she, she has spent her entire life though, being fit, working out, staying active. And she did all of that without the use of any anabolic. Um, and now that she's older, she's like, you know, but I'll go ahead and get me a pellet to make me just be able to continue doing what I'm doing. But that's at 50. You know, so, I mean, being older and starting a hormone replacement therapy, like I said before, that's totally different than taking six different anabolics just so you can compete in bodybuilding. Well, that's why I've always said, like, if I could build my athlete that I'd want to represent the company, it would be Jody Bohm for me, where she just recently had a kid and then she just competed in fitness and she still has the feminine voice. She still has everything. And that to me is like one of those things where it's like, you can build something around that where it's like, that's an athlete that you want to market and say that like, Hey, obviously you can take some stuff and you know, you can still keep the feminine side of you. And again, some people after their first dosage, they just completely lose a, a good chunk of their femininity. If we're being completely honest, some that's just genetically how they are. And then there's other people where they can take stuff for a long time and it doesn't really happen. And again, it's just the, the draw the cards, but it's like, there needs to be more of a representation too, because with the current product they're putting on the Olympia stage too, it's like, you're never going to get a general public to want to watch it then because the moment that the people step on stage and you're like, Oh my God, that's that. And I'm not, again, I'm not knocking any of the people that step on that stage, but I'm knocking them for the fact that they are not marketable at all. If we're being completely honest. Yes. Well, that's and that is a hundred that that is it if women want to because again back to this whole arnold thing so many of them are like oh well arnold should bring it back it's supposed to be all inclusive the thing is though is yes arnold stage is one of the is the second possibly even the first like biggest stage in the ifbb but not every promoter has every division the promoters are going to put the division out there that make them the most money that put butts in the seats that their sponsors want to be a representation of. And at this point, female bodybuilding, I mean, Jake Wood and wings of strength is one of the only, they are the only people who represent that division and they're getting to where they're the only ones who represent the women's physique division too, because they're so closely aligned. Um, and there are still some very beautiful bodybuilders out there. Um, there's a, you know, they're, they've still got a very feminine face, but they're actually not, they're, they're placing in the tops, but they're not actually winning. They're still knocking them for whatever, whatever it is. Um, they say, oh, it's a total package, but they sometimes don't mean the face is a part of that total package because there are some out there that uh, if you cut your body or if, there's some that if you cut their head off, you cannot tell if they are man or woman. And if you cut their body off, you still can't tell if they're a man or a woman. So there's some of them where if they didn't shave for a week, they might be like this too. Let's be, if we're being completely honest. Yes. Yes. And that is their decision. That is that. Again, we are not knocking them at all. We are not saying them. We are just saying that it's not, not a product that should be promoted for bodybuilding. If you want the sport to succeed, I am not, I am not yes. saying that you've made horrible life choices. I'm not doing that. You still put your work in, you still bust your ass in the gym. You still have the dedication of someone that is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. But Absolutely. it's like if I were to go and try to compete in a women's softball tournament right now, I would expect to not be that warmly received. Right. Exactly. And it's, it's not about the femininity anymore. And I think that the only, not the only, the majority of people that are going to be attracted to that look are going to be the fanatics, the, uh, the ones that maybe have a little bit of, you know, like a fetish towards something like that. And so it's more of a fetish sport as a, you know, what, what I've heard some people call schmoes. Um, you know, people that have a fetish towards that and it's, it's not so much. I mean, I saw so many people saying, well, nobody cares about bikini. Bikini is the most marketable, like bikini and wellness are the most marketable. That's what looks to be one of the most attainable, even though you have to have a certain phys like a certain portion to your body, your waist has to be small. They're looking for a, a more voluptuous, like, butt, things like that but they are the most attainable physique. And 
even now, like when you look five years ago, it's transformed into something else now. So evolution always happens. It's just not always a good thing. No. Not for marketability, not for general public. Yeah. And looking back on your buddy, bodybuilding career, if there was one moment that has stood out to you the most that you're the most proud of, what would that one moment have been? Um, man, uh, you know, I think when I, when I turned pro, so that would have been in 2016, when I went and got my pro card at, um, USA's, the prep for that show was extremely difficult for me in a personal mental way. I was going through a really harsh breakup with a very abusive person and I prepped through that I mean I was being stalked like he was straight psycho and I went through so much mental um, hardship during that prep that when I got to the end and I actually did get my pro card I think I was so beyond proud of myself not even like yes for the way I looked but more for what I overcome mentally throughout that entire prep to get there and then I was rewarded for it um other than that, I, um, uh oh, hold on. Time out. Sorry. God damn it, Brittany. <laughs> what the hell's going on in that I operation right there? My <laughs> iRobot, my iRobot <laughs> vacuum decided she was going to start cleaning. <laughs> so, no, when I was with my parents, that goddamn iRobot, they would have it go off at four in the morning just because they know that I was sleeping downstairs just so that, just to piss me off. My husband's addicted to it. I swear, like, we named her Rosie. Yeah, I'll say. Um, and when we first got her, he would run her four and five times a day. It didn't matter who was here. It didn't matter what time of day. He would just run her four or five times a day because he just enjoyed cleaning it out and being like, look at all the dirt that she picked up. Well, first of all, and before we even get back out. into the podcast part of it, the architecture behind you is stunning. Where did you, was, did you buy the house like as is, or did you guys design it yourself? We built it uh, okay. from like dirt pad up and I did uh I did do all of the interior designing for it and things like that. I should have looking back hindsight 2020, I should have hired somebody to help me. It was the most miserable thing ever. I'm glad that this is our forever home yeah. sitting on our forever land because I am never building another house. I, I mean, I am at the home buying age myself. I, I, let's be honest, but with my generation, I'm not going to be able to buy a home for probably about another five years. But like, I have been looking into it and I was like, why don't I just build my own house? But then everyone I've talked to has said, it may be just a tad cheaper to build it yourself, but you're going to have a heart attack and it's going to take you years. So now it, I've realized it, like, it yeah, might as well us, just buy your own house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took us one year from the day that we, um, the day that our pad was, or the day that we broke land to the day that we moved in was one year. And we were pushing, pushing, pushing. We were kind of our own general con contractors, but we did hire some guys that um, that I'd gone to high school with that build houses and they helped, like they sent us their people. They, for, they were technically the general contractors, but we they didn't really charge us like a contracting fee or anything like that. They just used the people that they use. Um, and we were still like really pushing. There were things, I mean, it took six weeks for cabinets, you know, I mean, there were, there were things that, that you would order and then have to wait on uh, because, you know, supply and demand is so crazy. And the pro the cost of materials itself just kept going up, going up. I mean, wood lumber was insane. So, I mean, the wood, we have a, a wraparound porch and we have shiplap underneath underneath the porch. And I mean, there's probably about ten thousand dollars worth of wood under there. That's why you'd be like one of my friends in, from high school when he moved up to northern Minnesota. He bought, I think it was like twenty acres in of a forest basically, and he had all the wood that he needed for his house. <laughs> See, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. That's now again, he had to cut it down. He had to pay people to cut it down, so you know that kind of offsets oh. the stuff. But yeah, but yeah. yeah. And then you have to mill it and yeah. then it has to dry properly like yeah all it, that's a whole process ours is just 52 acres of pasture like it was just already pasture we do have like a 200 year old boat art tree in the front yard 
um, that's really huge that we had to kind of like that we placed our house behind. Um, um, but yeah, ultimately it was a nightmare. I, the only, the easiest thing for me was picking my countertops. Yeah. That was the easiest thing. I walked into the shop and was like that one. I want that one picking colors. I about had a, a panic attack on and about the, like, like, you know, I actually like laid some out in front of Jeff and was like, all right, just pick one, like go and pick one and you do it because I can't do it. So countertops was the easiest. Let easiest me guess. He had the male response of, I don't care. Uh, I got that response several times and I would do this like, like my eye would kind of start like twitching and I'm like, don't say that. I've don't learned, I've learned that like pretending to care is well, well more worth it. <laughs> yeah. So it got to where I would, I would give him three different options like, okay, A, B, or C. And if it, I'd be damned if every time he did not pick my third favorite option, I'm like, please don't pick this one. He'd be like, that one. And you're like, okay, no, just pick from A or B. Did you ever think he was doing that on purpose so that you would not ask him anymore? No, because I would not really tell him. But if he knew you well I enough, did. he could be like, hey, maybe this will be the one that she likes the least. And if I pick – again, I am I could be a psychologist. No, I'm just kidding. But no, no that's – No, but that he might have been doing that, but it didn't work. Yeah. Didn't work. Yeah. Finally, I was just like, you make a decision. You have to pick the color of these cabinets. Well, and last, so he did that. Well, I got to say, lastly with our tangent, how cool is that to live in land that you've that's been in your family for 200 years? Because that is something that is very rare this day and age for a family to have that plot of land that they stay on for that long. Yeah, I mean, and it's, uh, so my great, great, great grandfather, you know, was here. Um, and uh, just the cemetery down the street, it's one mile from me. I have three greats back in that cemetery. Um, so, I, I mean, just doing the math, you had family living here on that land before Texas was even a state, probably when Texas was still part of Mexico, too, or close to that. Probably close to it. I can't really remember the year that my family came here from Tennessee. Because, like, the, 18, but, yeah, the, I mean, the late came, 1830s was the Mexican-American War, and then Texas became its own country in, like, the 1840s, and then it became its own state right before the Civil War. So, yeah, it's 200 years. It's yeah. – good God. Pretty close. Um, pretty close, yeah. So it's a – you know, but it's it was pasture land. There was a, there was a house that my, grand, that, my, that my grandfather grew up in here. Before that, there was another house that was here. Um, and, and then back in 2008, I believe we actually bulldozed the house that my grandfather grew up in off the land. And then it was just pasture land. They used it for cows and things like that. They leased it to some people and used it for cattle. And then in 2020, when my husband and I were like, it's time to get the hell out the city, like COVID turned people into like some craziness. And so we were, I was like, well, I got all this land out in Bogota and Jeff is like, let's go. And uh, I said that to my mom. I said, what would you think about us moving out, moving back home? And about three weeks later, they had a septic system dropped in and <laughs> we moved our I'm RV. Just gonna, so you're we, talking about COVID when drove people crazy. I'm just going to tell you this without even explaining anything more. I live 20 minutes away from where George Floyd happened, if we're going to be completely honest. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I get what yes. you're saying when COVID drove people crazy. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you- yeah. We're going to leave it at that. I don't want to get canceled here and have uh, my YouTube blocked and become a persona non grata there. But. I mean, yeah, I, but that is cool because, like, there's – I'm mainly Norwegian, so I have family back in Norway that have lived in, like, the same village for almost a 1,000 years, and we're going to go visit them one of these summers. And that, that, that that's going to be really cool, seeing, like, a village that you've lived in for that long where you're just like – I, I want to give them jo- – make a joke, be like, you guys really – you guys really lived with your parents for that long where it's been, like, over a 1,000 – I have I have so many jokes written down for that. It's not even going to be – you know, it's going to be horrible, but, that's, you know. But, okay, so yeah, back that's, at, that's really cool. Like, and there – you just don't find things like that around here. Yeah, so, absolutely, absolutely. Cool. especially in especially when you live in the suburbs like me, where it's like you might live in the house your parents got just because you can't afford to move out. That's about the only thing that you're ever going to get when generation wise when it comes when it comes to right. you know housing there. But so right. I mean, and we already talk about you know plenty of times on the podcast about how you build up such, such a mental toughness from com- competing, and now that you're done competing, has that mental toughness shown to how I've improved other areas of your life as well, because I've always said, if you can compete in a bodybuilding show, you can really do anything in life. So it's that mental toughness that you've got from, from competing shown itself in other ways and helped you out in other aspects of your life. Now that you've taken your break or retired or whatever, I know you said you might compete again, but like now that you've taken your break, I should say from competing. Um, absolutely. Uh, so like I said, we are fostering to adopt my four-year-old niece. Um, 
being that I'm 40 and spent 40 years of my life with no responsibility of a child, um, props to moms out there because she is something else. Uh, she's extremely intelligent, far more intelligent than I even think I might be like, she catches me on several things and I'm like, shut up. I'm the adult here. Um, so are you just admitting that a four year old might be more intelligent than you? I'm telling you, she's smart. Okay. She is smart. But I'm just saying she a four-year-old. <laughs> yeah. She says things and I'm like, you are four going on 40 already. Like, calm down. But she's... Is she giving like she philosophy does... of life kind of like questions and stuff like that? I mean, sometimes, yes. Jeez. Yes. Um, or she's just, she's got such an imagination on her, but she's very strong-willed. Um, and she is very, because of her situation that she has grown up in, um, previously, she is very survival mode. Like she immediately, the, the part of her brain that clicks that survival mode is constantly on. It's never turned off. So she can walk into a room full of people and she just, you can just see that little hamster will just like scan in the room, scan in the room, scan in the room. I'm going to go talk to that person. That person and me are going to get along. I have yet to meet anybody who does not like her that includes kids like there's no kids who are like I don't want to play with you her kids one of her kids at her school yesterday when I picked her up asked me is Susie really a kid why would you ask me that she says she's very smart this is another kid a five-year-old kid I'm like yes yes she is she is smart um so I would say mentally that took a whole lot that this is taking a lot of mental fortitude that I did not really know that I possessed. Um, also I started riding horses. I own three of them now. Uh, my husband tells me if I get one more, uh, I can have the horses and he gets to have the house. Um, I somehow acquired three horses in a matter of like three months. So I know I just, when I go all in, I go all in and I just, I'm like, Ooh, I like that one. Ooh, I like that one too. And then, you know, they just start to accumulate in the pasture. So he showed up a couple of weeks ago and there was one more out there. He was like, Oh, all right, what well, is this? Well, before we wrap things up, and, because uh, you brought up horses, I do have to talk about my, my, um, my horse story. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but this is, this is more uh, important. No, Brittany. This is the great, no, I'm just kidding. But so my, I'm all about it. I have family in Nebraska and they have, well, they're all dead now, but they had, my great uncle had a, a farm right outside of Omaha. It was probably like half an hour outside of Omaha. And they had horses there. They had chickens there. They had everything They had They used to have cows at one point. They would have f about 200 cats as well, which what would happen would be um, the, the feral cats. So what would happen? People would drop off their cats. There were never, they were not house cats. People would drop off their cats. Like if they didn't want them, cause they knew that'd be the place to be. And so there were, none of them would ever come in the house. So they would just stay outside. But the sad thing would be is that like, every winter uh, like probably about 150 of the 200 would die and then but then they'd all have kids or they'd all have kittens then so then you'd have more yeah. but like so anyway they were just like cats roaming around everywhere but anyway there was two horses that were there and one of the horses was a black horse that um had one blue eye and one brown eye and i called him stally the stally and when it, cause this i was young okay i wasn't I, i'm not a grown man calling a horse stally because that would be like the weirdest thing ever but okay i was like 10 years old and the horse I was not a horse whisperer, but every time I would go over and like say hi to them, they would always come up and like, they'd be very friendly. But one time my, so I was in the pen with them. Like it was a pretty big pen, but my little brother, they had a lot of guns at the farm too, that they would just let us shoot off if we wanted to. Cause it was the middle of nowhere. But like there was a BB gun that my little brother was probably about, you know, like eight years old had. And he thought it would be funny when I was right next to that horse. He didn't shoot the horse. Everyone, I got to spe specify that, but he was like, it was pointing the other direction, but he was probably I don't know, let's see, 10 feet away from the horse, and he shot the BB gun in the other direction. That spooked the horse, who then got up on its hind legs and then fell down on my foot. One of the hooves did. And it cracked one of my nails. And, ugh. So, to this day, whenever I hear horses, I have to, you know, sort of tell that story. But thanks again, Mitchell, if you're... And then he'll claim to me, he goes, that's not what did it. You spooked the horse. And I was like, was it the sound of a BB gun going off right next to it, or was it me petting it that really spooked it, you think? <laughs> You're lucky. You're lucky. You just got a cracked toenail. Oh my god! No, I am. Are, I, well, I was wearing steel-toed boots, and the thing fucking broke the steel-toed boots. Oh, okay. Well, that's yeah. I mean, they are. Um, so, 
I mean, horses, 800 to 1,000, 1,200. Yeah. I mean, some of them, I mean, they're 1,000 pound animals. And just like some dogs, some of these dogs, you know, they play rough and they're so big that they don't actually intend to hurt you. Yeah. They're just big enough that they just accidentally step yeah. on you or accidentally hurt you. Um, oh yeah. I'm not blaming the horse at all. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. And then, and then I started screaming and then the, obviously the horse ran away cause it was scared then. Cause obviously it's something screaming exactly. at, but, but then like, yeah, like I just, yeah. And again, the steel toe boots did say, because I'm honestly, I think I might've like lost a toe or two if like it, if it hadn't been for those steel toes, oh, yeah. but good yeah, God. Would, yeah. yeah. It could like busted your toe straight off your, straight off your yeah. foot. Maybe if you hadn't, steel toe. but I mean, having, having horses, having horses, takes a lot of patience. I mean, I have to actually chase one of them around for about 30 to 40 minutes sometimes just to catch him, um, to put a halter on him. Once you catch him, he's totally fine, but he does not care to be caught. Um, I have two that you can just walk right up and just slip it on and they're like, all right, let's go. Um, but they will teach you patience. They, um, you have to work with them every single day. So there are times like now, because I don't compete and stuff anymore. I mean, I still try and get maybe four workouts a weekend. The rest of the time that I would have spent in the gym, if my girls, if my kiddos at school or daycare, I'm out in the pasture screwing around with horses. Um, it's something, it's a new kind of, I guess, a new passion that I've kind of found. I've always loved horses. I've always wanted them. I just never really had the opportunity to actually get them. And now that we live out here and Jeff told me, hey, when you're done competing, when you decide that you are are going to be done for a little while, then you can get you some horses. And so that might have also kind of helped me decide like, hey, there's more to life out there than just competing, than just being in the gym. As much as I loved it when I did it and as much as I still do enjoy working out for myself just to be healthy, just to feel good in clothes and things like that. Um, like I said, there I've tried to expand my scope and find uh, other things that help me to fill my time, so I don't feel like I'm missing out. I mean, I know some people, some competitors, they're like, "If I don't compete, what am I going to do?" Like, I feel like I'll be missing out if I'm not competing. And really, to those competitors, I I really just have to say, like, just because you stop competing does not mean you're irrelevant in life. Yeah. Um, I did. I felt when I first started, when I decided I wasn't going to compete anymore and I saw some of my friends still competing and, and still being in stage shape and, and things like going to all of these workshops and, and these things. Um, for a while I did, I had that FOMO mentality, that fear of missing out mentality. And I was like, I can't believe I'm not going to this workshop. Um, and I really truly had to find just other avenues of life to give me that fulfillment to make to make it so, you know, I did feel like I wasn't just sitting around pouting because, well, I'm not going to compete now, you know, and I wish that they would, I wish it would go back to the way it was so I could feel comfortable competing. I don't need that. Like, I don't need to feel mentally bad about myself or think that I'm irrelevant just because I'm not standing on stage. And just because, you know, people don't know because I'm not sponsored by these companies or this, that, and the other. Um, and I do feel like there's a lot of people who, and, Danny Reardon actually has spoke on this and a lot in some of her podcasts and in some of her videos that competing mentally shut her down for a while. It mentally broke her for a little while. And now she's, now she's out, she's big into yoga. She's going to Peru and, and really changing her mindset and her, you know, environment to be better meant to be healthier physically and mentally and emotionally for herself. And I just think that is incredible. And so that's, I think since I've taken this long break, like I said, I don't want to think that I'll never go back to competing because maybe I'm just not ready to admit that yet. Um, but as of right now, I've gotten to a place where I feel comfortable that I'm not, where I feel good that I have other things in my life that provide me just as much and some, if not more, happiness than competing ever brought me couldn't have said it better and i'm glad that you're at that spot in your life because that's what i like to hear it's all about being happy and that's you know it's hard for so many people to really 
find that true happiness. So I'm glad that you're finding that. And I'm glad that you're doing well in life. And I'll end the podcast here with something that my uncle told me that relates to horses and to women, where he said, horses are a lot like women. Some of them like to be chased. Some of them will walk right up to you. And some of them will want nothing to do with you. That's the truth. (laughs) I just, um, I do. I hope, I hope that somewhere along the way, whether it be, you know, the IFBB, whether it be the coaches, whether it be the athletes themselves, I hope somebody can start, you know, much like you to take the stand and, you know, first of all, everyone, I didn't take a market. stand. I run a podcast where I interview some competitors and I just said, Hey, we need to change something. It does. It took me nothing to do with it. I, there was no bravery involved. I had no repercussions. I don't make any money doing this. I make like 200 bucks a month on YouTube doing this. That's about it. This is just a little hobby that I do. I have no financial incentive that was going to be lost. If I did this, I had nothing to lose. This was literally the easiest thing for someone like me to do it. I don't care what anyone says, but I will take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it is like, there's, you're you're standing up and you are supporting the health and the longevity of the sport itself that's in the in the era of social media that we are in where people are going to vomit their negative you know hateful speech and things like that if they don't agree with you you put yourself out there ready to accept both positive and the negative and because there are a lot of people who are not going to agree with the things that we said, who they're going to say, you know what, like, you're just upset because you don't compete anymore. You, you know, you're just jealous because you were never any, you know, you were never an Olympian. And I'm here to say right, right now that has nothing to do with it. But it does break my heart when I see a 25 year old who is growing a beard and a mustache and who will physically never be able to have kids. And she's too young to even really know if she wants to do that. Or it's very sad when, yes, there are, oh, today so-and-so died, you know, another competitor passed away. And it's never just, you know, Jane Doe, blah. It's IFBB pro Jane Doe died suddenly at the age of 42. 42, like, that's only two years away from me. Like, so there was still a lot of life that she could have had to live. Why that happened? Don't know. But when you are going to stick the stigma of IFBB pro right in front of her, number one, you're saying that is what she was, that you are defining her by her IFBB pro status. And number two, that just gives somebody an open door to say, well, we know what they do in the IFBB. I'll just say the one thing that pisses me off most is whenever they say died of heart issues. And then there was like one where it was like, she was 32 and she died of heart issues. And I was like, yeah, the heart issue was is that her heart couldn't handle the drugs that she was doing, so the heart gave out. That's the heart issue, basically. But right. no, I, 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 and I get why right. people, so. I, I get why people want to cover it up too and say like, hey, you know, like it's just like how if someone takes their own life. A lot of times, people just say they just died suddenly, and then that's a hint, hint sometimes if someone you know commits suicide, which I understand why because some people just don't want to admit it, and I get that one hundred percent. And but yeah, I just again more transparency. I think there definitely needs to be in the sport, and I'm again. I know my talk will do nothing to the sport. It will change nothing. My rant will just maybe insp- – my, my one thing for me is that, like I said in the videos, if I could just inspire just one person to stop slowly killing themselves, it's a mission accomplished for me. Yeah. I just think overall the industry, we need to do better. Coaches, do better. Do better for your athletes. Do better for your clients. Judges, do better. Do better for setting the standard for the division that you're judging. If you want – athletes to look a certain way let that be rewarded because whatever it is that's getting first place is inspiring the people who are up and coming to do exactly what they think that they're supposed to be doing to look exactly like the standard that they just set and athletes do better for yourself do better do your research be don't be afraid to tell your coach no i'm not gonna do that i don't want to do that And don't be afraid to tell yourself and admit to yourself, like, I don't want to go down that road. It doesn't make you irrelevant. There's plenty of other things to do than kill yourself to be a professional bodybuilder. Yeah. No, I I couldn't agree more. And, I mean, before we wrap things up, I just have a few final questions. So when you were first, you know, done working out as hard as you were and you were losing a lot of the size, how did you deal with that mentally? Just because when you're identified so much as being, you know, the big bodybuilder and a lot of people, and you see yourself in the mirror every single day, how did you mentally deal with just the loss of size at first? Because 
when you are competing for that long, just you identify as that person when your body slowly starts to change. I imagine it was quite hard to see yourself change. I'm still dealing with it, Ryan. I'm still mentally dealing with it. I don't know if I will ever fully come to the, like fully come and accept the fact that I don't walk around with abs all the time, that I don't have, you know, the physique that I did. I still make the, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. Man, I really miss my show body. I mean, pictures pop up, you know, pictures pop up, memories pop up, and you're like, damn, I want to look like that again. But I do not want to do what I had to do to do do that. So how am I deal? How how did I deal with it? I still am. I don't know how long I want. I will be still dealing with it. And I think that is part of a setback process for me because. If I'm still dealing with that three years from now, let's say I deal with it another three years from now and another three years after that, I don't know if I'll ever be able to put my back, put myself back into a position to have to start over with dealing with it. Because once you start down that road again, you're going to have to come back from it again. And I've already come as far back from it as I am now, and I'm still dealing with it Um, mentally like I still have body dysmorphia. I'm not 100% happy when I look in the mirror now. Um, And that affects me in other facets of my life. So I'm still dealing with it. I'm not perfect at it. I try every day to just be a little bit happier. Um, I try, you know, every day to just eat a little bit better uh, to make sure like, okay, I'm going to get four workouts in this week. Like that's what I've got to do. Um, And just to maintain and be healthy. Um, But yeah, like it's, it is still kind of a mind, a mind eraser when, you know, you look at yourself and you're like, shit, like, where are my shoulders? Like, where did they, where did they go? Or, you know, my, my legs have been the number one thing that has come on down because they were hard for me to build to begin with. Um, that was one of the hardest things for me to develop. And now that I don't lift the way I was, and a lot of that is because of injuries, my sciatic and my hip does not allow me to do that. Um, But I I just have to tell myself, I'm just going to do what I can. Something is better than nothing. I'm going to do what I can and work each day to just be satisfied with that. And before we wrap things up, if you were to be able to go back and talk to yourself, let's say right before you first started to become a competitor, what would be the best piece of advice that you would give that younger version of yourself before she started her bodybuilding journey? Oh, man. Uh, (laughs) Um, I'd probably have to tell myself to focus on the live in the now, but focus on the future. You're not going to do this forever. And I used to say I would, I'm going to compete till I'm 50 years old. I'm going to compete forever. Like if I can compete till I'm going to compete until I just can't do it anymore. That was unrealistic of me. And I think I would tell my pre pro self live right now, focus on the future and don't forget that there is life outside of the stage and beyond your days of competing. Um, I feel like if I might've done that and given my, if I would have kept that in mind, maybe walking away wouldn't have been so mentally hard for me. And so mentally damaging for me. No, and I, I, so. I, I totally get that. And again, Brittany, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and just sharing with us because it was an absolute like we had tangents there where we talked about horses and stuff, but Hey, that's going to happen. You know, anytime, anytime yeah, stuff yeah. like that happens, you know, I mean, you're talking to me for God's sakes and it's early in the morning for me. So my ADD brain, good God, I was even thinking about doing it this morning. And I was like, I was like, God, this is going to be a disaster, but no, it turned out, turned out just fine. But again, everyone go and check out Brittany on her Instagram page. I'll leave a link down below. And thank you for like, still, you know, posting and still being on that because I know some people, when they stop competing, they like just completely go black where they just, don't post at I all. They don't a, do anything. No, I understand that, but like some and you know, some people like never come bit, back. But yeah. uh, I think I think some of it though is a lot of what was happening in life. You know, like we can't really post pictures of my kiddo. Like oh, we can't yeah. really post pictures of, kind of against like Foster. This Rule. is the and kid I'm trying to majority, adopt. Everyone, look at her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when is a majority of your life, um, there's a lot of those parts that you can't post, and so you're like, well, I can't post the majority of my life. So what am I going to post? I mean. I've never been a fan. I was going to say, what are you going to post? Like just, picking her up from so and so elementary school at this city at this address and this this zip code, <laughs> or just I mean, you 
can't, we can actually post her, but we have to like put this thing over oh, her face so you can't really like tell. The, she like looks. the celebrity kids' faces where they have to blur them out. Yes. Yeah. So, but when when that's the majority of what's going on in your life, um, and, and I even think I made a post at one point that said just because you're just because people aren't posting doesn't mean life's not happening. Um, and it was the the picture of mine and Jeff's license that we received for foster and adoption. And so that kind of, I, I was hoping that would kind of let people know, like, look, this is what, this is what we're doing. This is why I haven't been very active. Um, but now like I'm trying, I am, I'm trying to get a little bit more back into it. You know, I'm not gonna lie. I did, just remember, for- I did remember that post, but the problem is when you have so many guests on that, like it, it takes you saying that for me to remember like, Oh yeah, I do remember that post where you, ch- and I was going to message you about that, but I am so swamped. If I'm going to be completely honest, that, like the fact that I didn't <laughs> message anyone is just a, a miracle. In and of it's itself, life. But, Oh my God. Yeah. It's love. But again, Brittany, thank you so much for coming back on. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And, and again, thank you for, um, thank you for doing what you do. And thanks for talking about the sometimes sticky subjects that you do talk about. You may call me a hero and I accept that. You may want to build me a monument and I'll accept that as well because, you know, I have done a truly the most, one of the most heroic things that's ever been done. Everyone, you know, there's me, there's, you know, the, I don't know, probably some Medal of Honor winners might be in my level, but, you know, other than that, you know, it's, it's pretty yeah, much I as me. Some, I, got, I got some Play-Doh. I can, like, try to... Build my own, yes, do that, absolutely, and then, yeah, you can, you know, put, put some anti-free, get it, get it, get it, put it in a freezer or something like that, get it nice and, like, rock hard as a statue, and then, yeah, you can mail it to me or something like that, but, and yeah. again, everyone, I'm being okay. totally serious for anyone that is doubting my sincerity. I am being more serious than ever, but, again, everyone, this That's is it. Ryan... Yeah, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.